Good afternoon. My name is Ryan Haas. I'm a fellow here at the Brookings Institution, and it's my pleasure to welcome you here for today's panel discussion on the U.S.-China technology relationship. This event is the culmination of research effort that's been led by Georgetown University's Initiative for U.S.-China Dialogue on Global Issues, involving 12 leading innovation and globalization experts from the United States and China. This group has been convened by Abraham Newman of Georgetown University and Henry Farrell of George Washington University in collaboration with Sui Lan from Tsinghua University. The group has met three times over the last uh, year or so to develop and pursue a shared research agenda on the role of technology in the United States-China relationship and on pra practical steps that could be pursued by both sides to advance the relationship. I think that it's safe to say that their work has come at a critical time. Never in the past 40 years of the U.S.-China relationship has technology issues played such a central role in the relationship or had such a profound impact on the bilateral relationship and, frankly, on the world economy. Today's panel is designed to help us break through the noise to really focus in on a few key questions. What are the root causes of the growing tensions in the technology space? What are the potential pathways forward for the United States and China in the technology space? What options does each side have for protecting itself while also promoting continued economic development and innovation? And what type of technology relationship would most benefit China and most benefit the United States? And I think that we are fortunate to have an all-star panel to help us march through these questions. We've assembled some of the best minds in this space, and I'm going to be ruthlessly efficient in introducing them so that we can maximize our time together for the discussion. You can find a fuller biography of their experiences and accomplishments in the welcome packet. Adam Siegel, starting from right, is the director of the Digital and Cyberspace Policy Program at the Council on Foreign Relations. Tsan Huang is a professor and head of the Department of Innovation, Entrepreneurship, and Strategy at Zhejiang University. Abraham Newman is a professor in the Walsh School of Foreign Service and Government Department at Georgetown University, where he serves as director of the Mortara Center for International Studies and chair of European Union Studies. Henry Farrell is a professor in the Elliott School of International Affairs at George Washington University. And Yeling Tan is a professor of political science at the University of Oregon and a fellow in the World Economic Forum's Council on the Future of International Trade and Investment. In terms of our format today, I've asked each of our panelists to provide a few brief framing remarks to help us situate where we are in this story. We will start out with Abraham and then Henry, then Yeling, Tsan, and close with Adam. I will then pose a few questions to the group to try to tease out a few additional areas of exploration. And then we will turn the conversation to you for a interactive and I hope robust question and answer session. We will wrap up by 2.30, uh, perhaps a few minutes early. So with that, I would like to pass the floor to Abraham. Great. Thanks, Ryan. Thanks also to Brookings for all the support in making this happen. We really appreciate it, and it's such a great venue to have this conversation. Um, let me just start by saying when we started this project, it was two years ago in May, um, this was before the ZTE case happened, and we brought this group together. We thought this was a sleepy backwater of U.S.-China interaction, and as the audience here I think today can attest, this is now really at the forefront. You know, it's in the news every day, and you know, we're very excited about it, but I think it's for many people in the group, it's, it's a shocking uh, turn of events, and I think that's why it's so serious that we get together and have these conversations with our Chinese colleagues, because you don't really know where these, where the next kind of hot button flash uh, kind of topic might emerge. So let me just kind of summarize a few of the key results of this conversation that we've been having for two years. Um, so I think the first is that we as a group are, um, we're skeptical of the frame that either we can go back to the way it was, that there's just a world of Ricardian specialization where the US and the Chinese technology sectors integrate in a seamless way, and we're also skeptical of the conversation that we can just decouple. They'll just be, you know, we'll just be separate blocks and our technology companies will go back uh, to having kind of almost an autarkic relations. So either framing it as like, we can just have the win-win continue or that it's gonna be zero sum 
um, is probably not going to be a great way forward for the two countries. And so what we're really focusing on is how do you have a world where you have continued interdependence, um, but you also have vulnerabilities? So you're working together in many technology chains, but you also have to realize that those interactions are creating uh, vulnerabilities and threats at different levels. It's not just um, an economic game, but it's also uh, a security game. And so I think that is the kind of the first major uh, realization that the group is trying to push forward. And what follows from that is that the vulnerabilities, there's not a consistent set of, um, of agreement on what those vulnerabilities are. And so there's at least three that we've thought about. One of them is just a technology vulnerability. that something provided by another uh, partner, another country might fail, and that might create some kind of uh, inefficiency in your technology systems. But the second is that it's uh, a political problem, that there, you know, we have different regimes in the United States and China, and there are political uh, skepticism, that the, there's trust that can be engendered between those two political systems. Uh, but the third is a set of national security equities, that it's not just about political or differences in ideology, but it's also that there are strategic vulnerabilities that arise through these supply chains and uh, innovation systems. And so when you're addressing how do, you, how do you maintain the interdependence, how do you mitigate the vulnerabilities that are raised by this really dense cooperation in technology, you have to think about, well, what's the concern in that moment? Is it technological, political, or strategic? Um, the second thing that we wanted to highlight is the idea that this is a dynamic relationship. So one move by one side, so some activity by the US government or the Chinese government, it doesn't just have a, a one moment in time effect. So we've seen this very clearly in the interaction with Huawei and the United States in the blacklisting of uh, Huawei. The response has been a move towards uh, self-sufficiency in China towards in the semiconductor industry. Now, whether that actually will be successful or not is unclear, but it's not that the end of the story is the Huawei ban. The next is it sets off a set of political conversations in China that then have consequences for the US-Chinese relationship. And so we really need to think about how we're interacting in the technology space as a dynamic process. It's not just a one snapshot kind of event. So uh, the kind of takeaways that we think about for policy is the first is how do you reduce uh, miscalculation? So there's a lot of, I think, um, uncertainty on both sides about what are the consequences of maintaining technology interdependence between the two sides. And so I think we're arguing that you really need to establish a set of clear rules of the road of how technology cooperation can continue and also ways to minimize miscalculation by, the, by political um, uh, uh, leaders on both sides that this is somehow creating political or st uh, strategic vulnerabilities. And the second, I think, implication we have is, is that governments on both sides really need to invest a lot more in understanding industry and technology in the current environment. So at least on the US side, there has been, I think, some de-emphasis on how industry can have security consequences. And we think the response is, is that bureaucracies across the US government in particular need to invest much more in how supply chains, new technologies, artificial intelligence, how those things, those industries are interdependent and how to understand those interdependencies because the lack of that knowledge in government agencies then we think will likely promote um, these types of miscalculations. So uh, with that, I'll turn it over to Henry. Okay, well, as I've said, this is a major transformation in the US-China relationship. And we also think that this speaks to a deeper transformation that is happening in the way that our globalized economy works. And you can see this most clearly, for example, in the debate over the uh, US-China fight over Huawei, which is very often depicted as being primarily around trade, but instead is really a deeper conflict around globalization, and in particular about the networks, the kinds of networks that have woven globalization together. So this is something that Abe and I describe in a recent article that was published in the journal International uh, Security uh, on a topic that we call weaponized interdependence. And here, the uh, uh, 
applying the insights that we, uh, we, we have come up with there to this situation, what one would say is that the current uh, fight over Huawei is really a kind of a, a marker of how it is that old notions about how globalization and the globalized economy worked, that these uh, ideas have, for better or for worse, been to a great extent abandoned. So that, for example, the United States, United States policymakers used to think about how when China was drawn further and further into the networks of the global economy, that this would have a gradual liberalizing impact upon China, make China more like the United States. And it's very clear that, that, that the consensus that this was going to happen, that consensus has more or less been destroyed over the last number of years and probably would have faded away regardless or not of whether President Trump was elected. And instead, what we're seeing is a new attention paid to the strategic relationship between China and the US and other powers, with particular attention being paid to how the networks of globalization don't necessarily serve to have this liberalizing impact, but instead how they can be weaponized, how they can be turned into tools of coercion. And if one looks at the major global networks, one can see how these networks have these hubs. These, uh, they tend to centralize around these particular hubs which can be seized by states and turned into a, uh, a means by these states in order to uh, conduct large-scale surveillance or else plausibly to uh, actually choke states off or choke businesses that are key to those states off from the kinds of resources that they need to work. And so this explains uh, much of how the Huawei story uh, has actually turned out. If one looks at uh, US fears about Huawei, they're very straightforward. Their fears that the uh, 5G network would allow Huawei Way and by extension the uh, Chinese government to do to the world communication system what the United States had done back in the day with the NSA. You know, if you look at how the NSA worked, you see how the NSA effectively used the United States uh, uh, position in the global telecommunications network, its access to many of these hubs, in order to uh, turn the uh, world communication system into a large-scale machinery of surveillance, and the fear uh, that China might do the same thing with Huawei, and on a far larger scale, because we now live in a world where 5G is a turning uh, turning. Uh, ordinary things into a kind of an internet of things so that uh, everything becomes connected, uh, we can see how the US feared that this was going to be uh, an opportunity for a country which it had begun to see as a geostrategic competitor to use uh, to use commercial dominance as a uh, means towards a different kind of dominance altogether. And we also see how the United States, in order to try and stymie Huawei, has turned to uh, effectively trying to uh, attack its uh, supplier list, attack its uh, ability to uh, actually to, uh, to draw upon uh, US manufactured technical components, which are important to Huawei's dominance. So effectively, this is a story of how networks on both sides are potentially being weaponized by states in pursuit of strategic dominance. Now, this is a difficult and important set of questions that we need to confront, especially in the United States-China technological relationship, because we are not going to get away, as Abe suggested, we are not going to get away from the fact that the US and Chinese economies are fundamentally dependent upon each other. They are deeply entwined in a way that it is going to be impossible to fully separate them from each other. There is a lot of talk about decoupling. There is much less systematic definition of what decoupling is, far less actual real uh, real um, sort of uh, inquiry into how it could successfully be accomplished. And this is for the reason uh, we think that it is going to be very, very hard to pull off on anything like the dramatic scale that some of the uh, newspaper headlines of the last couple of months have suggested. So instead, the United States and China are going to have to work out a modus vivendi. They're going to have to work out a set of rules of the road, which aren't going to uh, remove the jockeying for power, aren't going to completely get rid of the uh, strategic problems, but at least can turn them into something that can be tolerated in a situation where both of these great states are going to find themselves economically uh, joined at the hip, whether they like it or whether they don't. Thank you. Um, so, my turn? <laughs>
Right, so after Henry and Abe's uh, big picture, um, sort of laying out the big picture, my research uh, plugging into this group really focuses on the narrower topic of standard setting. And I'm going to encourage the audience here to think a little bit more about the domestic politics happening in China and how that feeds into the US-China strategic rivalry and questions of economic interdependence. So I focus on standard setting because obviously it's become the object of strategic interstate competition, right, as high-tech standards come to carry not just benefits of interoperability, but also reaping a monopoly economic rents and carrying with them very tricky um, security implications. And amidst this competition, there's been growing attention and concern focused on, out, on, on an outward-looking Chinese state capitalism as a potential threat, right? A threat not just to leading firms and high-tech sectors, but a threat also to existing global standard-setting institutions and, pol and policy processes. So my piece of research in this group really questions these um, these perceptions, right? It questions assessments of Chinese standard setting as a product of a coordinated, quote unquote, China Incorporated. And it questions frameworks that portray Chinese standards as being driven by an overarching techno-nationalism. So in the five minutes, I'm just gonna make three quick points. First, the first point is that while China is a one-party regime, it's the government standards policies are more the product of an internal competition between powerful techno-globalist and powerful techno-nationalist agencies, rather than a, a product of a coordinated China incorporated strategy. This competition doesn't apply just to standard setting, it's deeply entrenched, it's long-standing, it extends to other areas of industrial and economic policy, and more often than not, it hobbles the ability of the Chinese government to act cohesively. The second point I'm going to make is that globalization and this deepening interde interdependence between the US and China has raised the stakes of this interagency competition and affects the distri distribution of power within the Chinese bureaucracy and something that I think we need to pay a lot more attention to. So as China has liberalized its economy and become more integrated with domestic, uh, with global uh, economic institutions, this domestic intra-bureaucratic contestation over standard setting has become more and more intensified rather than more and more coordinated. To give one very important example, when China joined the World Trade Organization, as, as its major and a major event in its economic integration, WTO rules on standard setting actually empower the techno-globalist agencies within the government who advocate the adoption of international standards, strengthen the establishment of new standards through rather than around global standard setting uh, structures. These, global, these globalist agencies within the government, it's important to remember that they're traditionally quite weak, right? They don't have that much influence compared to the more powerful economic plan planning agencies. And it's precisely global integration that has given these agencies much needed leverage to push for liberalizing reforms and internationalist standard setting. Right, and this uh, uh, empowerment effect led to an overhaul of the standard setting regime within China, the institution of new regulations uh, when China joined the WTO to encourage the adoption of new international standards, and a domestic push for glo globalism as a path to technology upgrading, which stands in stark contrast to nationalist approaches that privilege indigenous standards. But that's not the only story, right? Uh, this deepening global integration has triggered a reaction from the techno-nationalist agencies within the Chinese bureaucracy as well. And these very powerful techno-nationalist techno developmental agencies like the National Development and Reform Commission have fought to re retain their policy influence over key industries by exploiting gaps in the global regulatory structure. So while we have very detailed rules for governing trade, we have fairly thin global rules for governing investment. And this is really really important to, to understand because control over investment approval is a large source of power for these domestic agencies. And in China, investment policy is fundamentally intertwined with technology policy. So as a result, it's these techno-nationalist techno agencies that have had the scope to set standards policies aimed at technology transfer and close collaboration through investment policy. So the third point I want to make is that depending on this interaction between the global regulatory structure, the trading system, the investment system, and the domestic political competition within the Chinese government, you can have many different outcomes, right? Ch Chinese standard strategies could alternately strengthen, maintain, or reshape the glo existing global standard setting landscape through a variety of channels, and it's driven not by a coordinated China Incorporated, by different s but by different sets of domestic agencies. And to bring this back to the current uh, interstate rivalry between the US and China, one intended consequence of US 
policies to decouple the US and Chinese economies is that they, these policies have generated negative feedback effects that undermine whatever leverage the techno-globalist agencies have had to advance their agenda. These policies have ended up empowering the very techno, the very techno nationalist agencies that the decoupling policies are meant to guard against, right? Enlarging the policy influence of the nationalist agencies in the domestic bureaucratic contest. And in this way, the te technology conflict and Chinese state capitalism have ended up becoming a self fulfilling prophecy. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, so thank you for having me here. So uh, I just want to a uh, few observations about a topic related to today's uh, um, uh, um, the panel. Uh, the first one is about um, uh, the interest of China um, in terms of this decoupling. I think you may know that the official um, stance of Chinese government is not China is not interested to decouple for, from from U.S. and 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 I think the the two economy. I mean, collaborate and, and work pretty well in, in the last decade or so. I mean, there's a word invented called Chimerica. Two, two countries <laughs> married together and by symbiosis, and, and one used the other's capital, the other used the other's uh, uh, labor, and, and work very well. But now, suddenly come up with the idea of decoupling, I think the Chinese and Chinese company, Chinese government feel very, very uncomfortable. That, that, that's first my, my observation. And now, the second thing is that, so if you as a lot of tr action actually see from Chinese side is, is coming from US, US side. So US take actions and Chinese has to respond. And a lot of response are, are, are not very prepared. And, 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 and then if US uh, continue uh, down the road that's to really uh, sever the two economies, I think that will bring back the, um, the feeling to, to Chinese or Chinese government, a bit of the idea of deja vu in the, in the late 1950s when the Soviet Union put off all its experts from Chinese first five-year program. And then basically all the Chinese high-tech or media-tech project, military uh, development project was stopped because of the, 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 the Soviet Union uh, expert left. And, but somehow China find out it has to uh, build its self-reliance on its own capability and then uh, re-emerge re -emerge from, from, from the scene. So then what's the consequences of that? If we will learn from the history of that part of history, he said China was not hurt. Actually, China built up its own system, manufacturing system, industry system, in which the day China has the, China is the only country in the world, has all of the manufacturing sectors, cover all the uh, industry classifications defined by UN. It's the only country in the world. So the consequences of China actually, for many Chinese, probably is not bad. Huh? So then who are going to suffer more from this decoupling? A lot of Chinese think probably it's not China. Because, because if China can, can buy from the US, actually work very well for Chinese company. Because they don't need to push, uh, put so much effort to upgrade their capability and, and that part the US company did is very hard. It's this crown jewel of the high tech industry and China has difficulty to, to, to grapple, I mean, to, to grasp it in, in very short time. But now it forced no, it become a no choice. It has to develop it on its own. Then it's got to be done. And then a lot of incentive will be put on that. One example of that is that the Huawei instance, China's government just exempt of the uh, value added tax for all software companies in China. So those companies benefit from Huawei suffering. But then it will actually promote this uh, industry and then will create incentive for more talents to work in this industry um, in, uh, software as software engineers. So the second point is about us. if China has to build up self-reliance, maybe it's not bad for China. <laughs> The third point, I want to argue that the winner or loser in this decoupling trend, decoupling gain, is hard to tell. I think for each country, there were winners, there are also losers. As just I put an example for the software company in China, they are the winners of this coupling because of their, their, they don't pay tax, value added tax at this moment. But there were losers, the losers who are not able to purchase uh, advanced equipment, they will fall off the, uh, the, the, the value chain, they will go out of business. I think also for the US, it's the same. For the US high-tech companies, basically you sell technology to China, but technology is, the value is not eternal. Right? The next generation technology, when it's invented, the past generation technology will be obsolete. There's no value. So if you don't sell, you don't have value of a technology, it will be replaced later. So then for US, 
The high-tech company, if you don't sell to China, which is the largest market probably, in terms of technical uh, products, you are probably not able to sell uh, the other big customers. So there are also huge risk for US high-tech company, spe uh, specifically for their uh, balance sheet. And, and they will, their stock market price will be hit if they really go down the road. And for China, it's the same. As I say, they will lose as winners. So I think it's hard to really calculate, at least from my point of view, who are going to be benefit more in this uh, big trend. So that's why China doesn't want to decouple. Okay, I stop here. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. So I, I'll just pick up um, with some final thoughts, um, primarily from the, from the U.S. side, and 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 I, I was most interested um, in the in the larger point that San Juan was making about who's going to win or lose from this competition. You know, we, we've had uh, 30 years of globalized innovation. The two biggest beneficiaries were the United States and China. Uh, I, I think it is clear that both sides are trying to reduce vulnerability. How do you think about uh, how that is going to energize the two different innovation systems? Uh, what type of outcomes is it, is it going to uh, create? And my basic assumption starting in was that, in fact, the US is probably going to be hurt more in some ways, given that uh, our innovation system has been uh, driven in so much by openness uh, and many of the uh, policy tools uh, that you would need uh, in a more closed system are uh, either uh, unavailable to us uh, or, or hard to mobilize. Um, but I think um, having uh, the council uh, produced a task force last week on U.S. innovation and national security, uh, chaired by Admiral McRaven and uh, Dr. James Monica, I, I have kind of three big thoughts about uh, where we are in, in the debate uh, about how the U.S. is going to respond, and th these are more questions than, than answers. The, the first is, um, is more of the same enough, right? And, and the task force, to be quite honest, is a response to the traditional tools of, of U.S. innovation strategy, right? Uh, funding for basic R&D, uh, openness to immigration, uh, ensuring a uh, STEM pipeline, uh, making sure the DOD and the private sector work together and working with our allies, right? So uh, looking at all the old knobs and turning them to 11, right? I think there is a growing debate about is that enough? Uh, and the task force uh, touched on that by talking about moonshot approaches, but the, if you look at Senator Warner's speech last week at the USIP and, and uh, the legislation that's been introduced or, or um, some of the papers produced by uh, Senator Rubio that we need to have a discussion about industrial policy or something that looks like industrial policy or in industrial policy in a US context. Uh, I think we're moving into a world where a lot of people think, okay, it's not enough just to slow China down through the export controls, but are there new policy tools that we should be adopting to try to speed faster other than just increasing basic R&D, which is important uh, and, and, um, uh, and useful and, and we definitely need to do. The second is more of a rhetorical question because the answer is yes, but, or a lot. Uh, how significant is the, the lack of technical knowledge in the, in the government? when you're designing these policies and you're designing the responses to China. Um, and, and here, I, I, everything I hear from people, both on the Hill and in the private sector, is uh, the policies uh, are often designed with very little understanding of second order or third order, much less fourth or fifth order outcomes, right? Especially when we're talking about supply chains and how you might affect those, move those, uh, decide which companies are going to move up the value chain or, or how those gains are going to be captured. Lots of ideas floating around how do you address that technical knowledge gap, right? The bring back the OTA, uh, more fellowships, more flow between people, but that, th that has to be happening now, right? We, we have to have a much better sense of the technologies involved and, and how they're actually deployed across a range of sectors, right? AI is not going to look the same uh, as quantum is not going to look the same as um, uh, semiconductors, even though we're all glumping them together as emerging technologies. Um, and the final uh, uh, rhetorical question is, uh, how important it is that we don't really seem to have uh, a single voice uh, 
uh, coordinating mechanism for this strategy, right? So I, I think there is a fairly broad consensus that technological competition with China is important. Uh, it is a national strategy, it is a national uh, requirement, but again, from what I'm hearing from the private sector and from the Hill is that there are, there are many voices uh, often competing uh, and not explicitly being driven from executive agency. Uh, I mean, I think you can read some, again, some of the legislative suggestions from, from Senator Warner, for example, to create an office of critical technology is an attempt to kind of force the White House's hand and say, you know, if, if, you, if you guys aren't gonna do this out of OSTP or any, uh, the NSC will we'll create an alternative. Um, but there seems to, from my perspective, to be a need for and a desire for a comprehensive view of Again, the technologies that are we're worried about, the technologies we're competing over, because uh, there's nothing to be gained from framing all Chinese technological advancement as a risk to the United States. Right? Clearly, there are some sectors that are much more sensitive than others. Some we have more control over than less. And so where, it, where is that comprehensive view going to be? DOD is certainly putting something together because it's worried about supply chains and competition, but is that the same list that commerce and state and others are, are looking at? So I'll, I'll stop there on those kind of larger policy questions. Well, thank, thank you all. This has been uh, a tremendous start to our conversation. I think that we have already seen original thinking at work here with weaponized interdependence, a fresh original path-breaking argument. The idea that China is not a monolith where everyone is marching in a single direction. There is actually intense friction within the system. The suggestion that we may be in a 1950s-like moment in 2019 with China and the Soviet Union and now China and the United States. And then the questions, the very provocative questions that uh, have been put on the table by Adam about how the United States is and can be responding. So there's a lot for us to, to chew on here. If I could, I just want to start a bit chronologically. I'd like to ask all of you, or as many of you as interested in jumping in on this question, to help us understand when the psychological breakpoint occurred. When did the United States and China go from viewing the economic relationship as mutually beneficial and leading to increased efficiencies to all of a sudden becoming seized by vulnerabilities and taking more of a defensive crouch to try to protect against uh, risk of exploitation by the other? I think for a very long time in Chinese policy circle, they were saying that China cannot rely on foreign supply of critical technologies because the most critical technology China cannot buy from the suppliers. That's been saying for maybe a decade or at least a very long time. But nothing has happened. So people don't tend to believe that it will happen until the ZTE incident in 2017. I think that's the, the very moment that's I think it's a watershed event in, if we look back in future, back to in retrospect, that will actually change psychological uh, uh, of the Chinese policymaker. That things can happen. That, that one big multinational company with 80,000 employees can be killed in one night. No natural disaster can kill a company in, the, in one night because the multinational company, they learn to adapt to the natural disasters. They will. Uh, reduce their risk by, by well manage the supply chain. They will uh, not put all the basket in one, not act in one basket, but they cannot prepare for government force. And no company can survive facing a most powerful government in the, in the, in the planet. That will that create the urgency for Chinese policymaker and business community that this can happen to us one day. And one year later, it happened again to Huawei. But Huawei is not any company in China. Huawei has prepared for this for 10 years, at least their CEO said that. So when they decided not to sell to Motorola, they already decided we will compete with US in the top of the hill in the future. So they prepare for that moment to happen. That's why they have that plan B for in place for 10 years. And that's why they cannot be killed in one night. And so I think that's the moment that I want to answer your question. So, uh, I mean, look, the, the, certainly the, the DOD has been worried about supply chain vulnerability in China for a long time. Um, I, I, I think psychologically there was a sh beginning of the shift uh, at the end of the Obama administration. In particular, if you look, I, I always, I think, point to the PCAST report on semiconductors uh, and the DIU report, which came out in the first months of 
uh, President Trump, but was you know in in play at the end of the Obama administration. PCAS report on semiconductors basically says, you know, we the we, we are now in a real technological competition with the Chinese. Uh, they have these uh, national plans. They're, they're merging, you know, merger, overseas mergers and acquisitions. They're purchasing really important technologies. We still think we can outrun them by openness, but we may have to re uh, result, uh, resort to other more interventionist policies or, uh, or, or um, uh, sanctions against China. And then on the DIU report, uh, that really, I think, flipped the switch on suspicion about Chinese technology, uh, Chinese investment in early stage uh, in the United States, and that, uh, you know, CFIUS is not going to work, it's not working the way that it should, uh, that there is just a much broader effort to get around uh, controls in place, and that we have to be much more sensitive. That, that those two documents, I think, were really important in kind of shifting the policy community. I think also, um, you know, there of course was uh, Xi Jinping coming to power uh, and consolidation of uh, cybersecurity law um, and the creation of the uh, the small group and and the, and the beginning of what clearly looked on the Chinese side of efforts to re reduce their own vulnerability, but by squeezing U.S. tech companies, um, that shifted the business community uh, in a large part. I, <clears throat> let me just add that I think that um, the that in many ways September 11th and the consequences of September 11th play continue to reverberate in these conversations. And so what I mean in particular was that after September 11th, the U.S. government started to think about alternative tools in order to fight terrorism. And they focused very much on how global economic networks could be used in that fight. And so if you think about the SWIFT system, which is the global banking system, though it's a secure messaging system that banks use to make bank transfers, the US government targeted that system as a way to basically know what adversaries were up to, particularly terrorist adversaries, but also rogue states was used then in the Iran sanctions program. Uh, in addition to that, the NSA programs that were used to tap into global internet infrastructures also did the same thing, where it said global economic networks can be a tool uh, to uh, kind of a forensic tool to figure out what adversaries are doing. And it, these all came to the head in the Snowden revelations when it was made very public of how global economic networks were being used for coercive ends. And I think if you see some of the responses by China, but also by other uh, you know global actors like the European Union, it was an effort to uh, buffer themselves from and insulate themselves from how these global economic networks might be used in a coercive way. And the cybersecurity law, the data localization requirements in China, I think are very much a reflection of those concerns um, that were put on the table during that process. Uh, just to point out that there are two words which have not been uttered by any of my fellow panelists. They are Donald and Trump. And there's a good reason for that, which is that it's very clear that most of the stuff would have happened, albeit in a slightly different way, if Trump had not been elected as president of the United States of America, that uh, the uh, security shift had already happened, as Adam said, in the uh, towards the end of the Obama administration. A Clinton administration would likely have been uh, quite hawkish on these issues as well, and probably would have been more consistently hawkish and would have not had the uh, persistent tendency that President Trump has had to try to bargain away uh, concessions over ZTE or Huawei in return for trade uh, things that he views as being more important. So this is a, you know, so this this could have happened in a variety of different ways, but it really is a structural transformation that has happened, which is not which has been exacerbated in some ways by the chaos and craziness of the uh, policymaking process under Trump, but which is a, not a product of it. So, so I totally agree, and I, I, I think that the structural frictions between the, the two countries go back um, and predate the, the current dynamics. So I think, Ryan, the question you asked is really interesting, right? Like, when did this all start? And there are a bunch of explanations out there kind of all floating around in the ether. Some think of Made in China 2025 that was issued in 2015 as, as this, you know, critical moment. 
Some attribute it to Xi Jinping coming to power and his centralization of power and everything he's done domestically. Some attribute it to 2008 and the global financial crisis because China's huge stimulus really, you know, um, kind of supercharged the role of state-owned enterprises within China. Personally, I think that the more important turning point predates all of that and, and happened around 2006 with the issue, issuance of the 11th five-year plan that really kind of focused, placed much more policy focus on indigenous innovation. And it coincided, again, with this, this, this um, dynamic I was talking about earlier with external leverage, it coincided with the completion of a lot of China's WTO accession protocol commitments. So you had this declining external leverage and these developmental agencies kind of pushing their, their um, industrial policies. And what's really important to note is that if you, if you, I think that it predated all of these events because is because if you look at the data, right, the AmCham survey data, they survey their firms every year, is around 2005 that business sentiments really started dipping. If you look at the USTR reports on Chinese, uh, China's compliance, it's around 2006 that the tone really starts shifting um, to, to become a lot more negative. So I think it's important to look back, kind of not get too distracted by what's going on right now. Well, thank you. And in that spirit, I want to pick up on one, one thread that you had, which was indig indigenous innovation. This idea that China will become much more dependent upon its own sources of supply and much less willing to trust that the United States will continue to provide the inputs needed for China's continued economic growth. I think it was either Henry or Abraham that introduced the idea that ZTE and Huawei may have an effect of accelerating China's push towards indigenous innovation and reducing its reliance upon American sources of supply. I also hear the argument from friends in Washington that China was going to do this anyways, so it doesn't really matter that much. How do you guys come out on this question? Does it matter, or is China already preset on a course of becoming more dependent upon itself, less dependent upon us, and ZT and Huawei are sort of immaterial to that trajectory? So, <laughs> so I think from the policy, from the paper, China always wants to have a self-reliance on a cri critical components. But in reality, many companies have no incentive to, to do if they can buy from US. So the paper and reality is very different because that part of critical technology is very difficult to, to develop and very, very advanced and, and it will take Chinese company a lot of efforts, a lot of risk to develop. And many companies in China will say, if you innovate first, you can die first. <laughs> so there are huge risks to develop those critical technology. That's why in paper, it says very well. But in reality, nobody does that until ZTE instant. Because ZTE instant shows that it can happen. So then, rather die in sanction, maybe you die in innovation. <laughs> so I, I, I think the, the, the sense that it doesn't, I, I mean, I think that's right. I, I think the Chinese have been very clear that they want to reduce dependence over a long time. But the, this, and, and they've been trying, and I'm glad uh, Yeling brought up the mid to long term plan because you don't get to talk about it very much anymore. And we can bring it back. But it was all in the mid to long term plan, and, and, and all these things were, were out there. But when we say it doesn't matter, then basically we're, we're just, and, and I think it's popular now, it's just like, oh, domestic politics in China don't matter anymore, right? Because Xi Jinping has made the decision, and they're all just going to go down this, and it's all, and it's all inevitable. And I, and I think, you know, part of that's the backlash against engagement and, and everything else. But, you know, there, as, as Tsang Hong said, there is still domestic politics in China. And it is clear that, you know, they were never the dominant voice. There's, there was a, a voice um, in China that said, yes, we want to, to move towards self-reliance. But the, we're most likely to do that through the way we've been doing it the last 30 years, which is through opening up and engaging supply chains and, and, and investing it. Those voices were, you know, already being silenced under Xi Jinping, anyways. But the tech war certainly has pulled the rug out underneath from them, and now the resources are going to the techno nationalist voices. So yes, they were going to do it. They would have just done it probably more slowly or with different tools and, and less intensity. But but we would always should have been aware, and and we still, you know, that their goal was to release the. Uh, reduce dependence, which is what any large country would want to do. Yeah. So I have another question for you guys. Uh, how innovative is China's economy? 
on one hand, we hear stories about the 996 work culture, this Darwinian, you know, thrashing around in, in China's innovation ecosystem, and just the, the accelerating pace of, of Chinese innovation. On the other hand, there are still people who say that China's more effective at process innovation than pure innovation, uh, that they're very good at, uh, at taking things and making them a little bit better. Where, where do you guys come on? The, the underlying question is, how intimidated should the United States be about the progress that China is making in its own innovations? <laughs> so, so I'm from business school. So, I we have we hold our forum regularly with uh, with the Chinese top CEOs, uh, and and what my observation is that China is very good in doing things from one to one hundred. Not so good in doing from zero to one. And I asked this question to a top CEO of Chinese uh, uh, top company uh, managed by central government. He agreed with that, because I just listened to his speech. And he said, that I only invest in R&D project, which I saw the ex example of success in other part of the world. And when my subordinate report to me that a new project, I asked him, has anybody done that before? He, the point is to pitch or revealing this. So I asked him in openly that, is that the will you look at it? He said, yes, indeed. And many Chinese top companies, they held the same view. They are not comfortable in doing from zero to one. But once they saw a successful example, they can very efficiently scale up the, the production capacity and then to from one to 100. China is very good at this. So I think actually now US is very good from zero to one, and China is very good in one to 100. The best to two countries work together <laughs> and not to fight with each other because each has its strengths and weaknesses. Um. So I just want to pick up on Ryan's point of how worried should we be? And, and this is, I think, one of the insights of our group is that um, it really depends on what set of equities you're prioritizing. So, you know, and these often get mixed up in this conversation. You know, is the concern that this will become a national security threat, that there's some innovation by the Chinese in AI that will not just be an economic concern, but it will be a security concern? Or is the concern a kind of a, um, that certain certain sectors are winner take all sectors? So if we fall behind, then we'll, you know, or is the concern a China shock you know, so anyway, by, by identifying what the actual concern is, I think it really helps you think about how worried should you be. But the other thing, I mean, at least in Henry's and I, our mind, you know, we're really concerned about the national security zone. You know, when is it this innovation could threaten us? And for us, it's really about these hubs, the control of a central kind of uh, technology that everybody has to route through to get their products or processes pr uh, processed because that's where you get this choke point, the ZTE effect. And there, I think we need a set of rules of the road of like, don't attack those hubs. You know, like the US uh, was in a period, it was almost like a kind of a Bay of Pigs moment where the ZTE and the Huawei cases, they I don't think the US government even really realized how, uh, what kind of an earthquake that would unleash in China because they didn't really think about it in this way that there are certain areas of the technology chain that if you weaponize those, you're putting the existential life of a country's companies at risk. And so we really have to think about which are those key hubs and how do we then create a kind of a, you know, a no first use policy around them. I, I think, uh, you know, Tan Hong and I had a debate about this two years ago at, at um, CSI, CSIS and, and we basically agreed. I, I mean, I, I think that's right. You know, uh, China still does not have the system in place to create new to the world, fundamental science-based innovation. They're building it. They're trying extremely hard. They're getting, I think, a lot closer. Um, but I, I think there are things to, you know, it's gonna come. There's, there's, there's no way it's not gonna come. Quantity yeah. has a quality of its own. And even if, uh, uh, you know, there are the, uh, Xi Jinping in many ways is moving in the wrong directions for the intellectual atmosphere and the free flow of ideas and 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 all those other things. It's going to come, right? There's just no reason to believe that eventually there won't be, given just the amount of resources and things like nano and quantum and synthetic biology, where you know the U.S. is slowing itself down because of other concerns, that there is going to be a major breakthrough in China, and you know one to a hundred is pretty important, you know over over time, and we know that. 
you know, the Chinese are, are um, it's incremental uh, innovation, but it's really important business innovation. And, you know, we all know from the fintech side and everything else that the Chinese are, you know, ahead and, and getting even farther ahead. Um, so I have, you know, historically argued that the U.S.'s kind of um, lead in kind of science-based innovation is pretty secure. I, th I think that's still true. But I, I just I, I am less certain these days that the, that the Chinese are not getting closer to the type of breakthrough that we think has been out of their reach. I mean, I, I think it's a bit of a mixed bag. I mean, you see examples of tremendous successes. You read a little bit less about the tremendous failures, but there are also a lot of tremendous failures out there. And, and I think if you look at the successes, you know, some of the best companies and innovators that have come out of China have succeeded in spite of industrial policy rather than because of industrial policy. And so, you know, I, I think it's important to to read national policies like Made in China 2025 with, with a bit of a grain of salt. Um, and it's not that the Chinese government is, is so tone deaf uh, in, in terms of what is required for, for a healthy innovation system. It's because of these internal coordination problems where a lot of central plans, you know, get distorted at, at, at local levels, um, but at the central government itself, you know, we was t I was talking about this with uh, Professor Liang earlier, you know, the central government's thinking about industrial policy has evolved as well to actually be a lot more open to market-based forms of innovation and thinking about how to encourage firm-based uh, activity rather than everything going through administrative guidance. So I think it's, it's a really mixed bag. Okay, I want to uh, be a bit dramatic for a second. Abraham talked about decoupling as something where we both poke each other's eyes out and we all become blind. Tan Huang talked about it as, well, maybe China, maybe China can make gains here. Maybe we can win. So how, how do you guys, as people who look at this issue for a living, think about this? Because those are two very different viewpoints, and I just want to draw both of them out so that the audience has the benefit of, of those perspectives. Are we going to all become blind, or is one party going to win? OK, I'll jump in first, which is that, as I said, uh, decoupling is one of these words which nobody quite knows what it means in practice. It's, uh, you know, it, 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 it clearly means that in some way or another, the uh, Chinese and the US economies would become disengaged from each other. You see aspects of this which are already happening in the uh, tech and innovation space, uh, the uh, greatly increased suspicion of uh, Chinese-born scientists in the United States. You, you, know, you, can, you can see also uh, this happening in supply chains. You can see a lot of stuff happening. But, the qu but when people talk about decoupling, I think they usually mean something which is much, much, much more substantial and much bigger than that. And so the question is how exactly, you know, how exactly can you can you uh, scale up decoupling on a mass level? And it's really, really hard to do. We've already heard about how difficult it is for China to actually do stuff. You know, so there are grand pronouncements. Uh, implementing them uh, through a very complicated and uh, contested policy system domestically is really hard. We see that with the United States as well. The United States government has uh, tried and failed for a period of, I don't know what, 15 years now, something like that, to try to get through comprehensive cybersecurity legislation. Uh, the United States, uh, when, it, you know, when, when it comes to imposing regulations on business, it's very, very hard to get stuff through Congress. So the United States uses things like procurement policy. It uses standards uh, as ways to uh, try and achieve uh, these goals at second hand. But it turns out to be very, very difficult to do this really comprehensively. So I would love to see, you know, so I think, I think that the answer to that question, as I say, is that I don't think that decoupling is going to happen on anything like the uh, scale that people says that it is. We are clearly going to see some decoupling in that, uh, especially in 
obviously sensitive sectors. We are going to see a, a move on both sides to uh, try to uh, separate supply chains to uh, protect against a variety of threats, whether those are subversion of the supply chain uh, is one threat, whether it is removal of key elements uh, from international supply chains in order to uh, cripple companies is another. We are going to see that shading to some degree into a variety of other sectors because we're now in a world where uh, pretty well everything has potential security consequences. You know, self-driving cars is one obvious thing uh, where, you know, so if you can think about uh, how they could have very unfortunate security applications if they were compromised. But we're, but it's not going to be possible, I don't think, to really decouple on a uh, comprehensive level, both because the economies are too deeply interpenetrated with each other and because neither side has the tools that they would want to really impose this on the micro level on businesses that are going to have different interests and different commercial interests, which are going to push them much of the time to want to work together with each other. Um, yeah, and I, w I would just say, I think that the word decoupling is, is, is a bad word. And I think we should, I think we should av avoid it because I think it gets away from the real question, which is how does interdependence between these two economies create vulnerabilities? And when you say decoupling, you, you could mean anything. You know, it could be like, we're going to turn into France. Do you know what I mean? France has a lot of regulations about how people enter their market, use their market. Is that what we mean? We don't like to say that because we don't like to talk about regulation in this country. But you could imagine a form of a evolved U.S.-China relationship that is just, we have more rules about market entry and use. You know what? China has a lot of rules about market entry and use, and it's not like a geostrategic conflict about it. It's like, oh, we don't like that. Our firms would less, like less joint ventures. You know, like, so you could imagine a relationship where it's like interdependence and vulnerabilities where we're targeting those things. If you really go down the path to decoupling, I mean, we are seeing the live action train wreck that is happening in Brexit, which is real decoupling. That's, you know, that's what you're talking about. And the fact is, is that that is not what we want. You know, like that, the consequences of that would be really significant. I think it's much more productive to think about types of interdependence raise vulnerabilities. How do we address those vulnerabilities? Yeah. Very, quick. Very quickly, we should think about mitigation rather than decoupling. I really, I really think it, it depends on where we end up in the debate on, on this side, quite honestly. Um, so, uh, I, I mean, I agree with uh, Henry and Abe that, yes, if you're thinking about it as there are these vulnerabilities, they exist in certain technologies or supply chains, you want to mitigate those, then, then you think about, you know, well, you'll decouple a little bit or you'll reduce the vulnerability in this sector, but it'll be fine in that sector. But reading some of the, the speeches most recently that have come out of the administration where they have t basically are talking about the fusion of the party state and the technology sector, right? That especially when they refer to civil military fusion, that the two are now essentially inseparable. Um, and that, you know, anything we do with the Chinese or any technology company that Chinese technology that benefits then benefits the, the Communist Party and surveillance and repression. Uh, and military power projection, then, you know, I, I don't think it's realistic as uh, uh, it, that we fully decouple because I don't, I just, you know, from a practical perspective, but that strikes me that becomes the goal in some people's mind when it is no longer just a mitigation contest. It's an ideological contest across the board, which is, you know, it's a much different type of competition. Great, thank you. Um, another issue that gets raised on occasion is this idea of the emergence of separate technology blocks, with the United States leading a block mostly of developed countries and China leading a bifurcated block of mostly developing countries. On a scale of one to 10, with 10 being most likely, one being least likely, how, how likely are we to see that type of dynamic emerge in the coming decade? this and take a risk and go first. I think if you look at countries outside of the US and China, neither of, most of them don't want to be in a block. I, I think most countries want to be, you know, engaging with both the US and with China. Good. Anyone else wants to jump in on that one? Uh, I, I think there's some possibility so if U.S. really push hard on this direction, because definitely this is not China's interest. Uh, 
So we got a three standards on 3G tele, uh, uh, mobile telephony and two standards in 4G. Only one standard in 5G. Because why? Because company realized that if you have uh, too many standards, you are going to duplicate your efforts to develop equipment for multiple markets. It wastes of the uh, resources to, 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 to chip the single. Now you have one standard, you can call everybody, and you just need to manufacture one set of equipments. That's it. So I think, then what's the, what about 6G? So if we, if US push, push down very high on this down road, maybe 6G there will be two standards, I don't know. It's, it, it's prob there's a prob probability, but that's not good for everybody. Not good for, for, for the US block, not good for Chinese block, not good for any equipment manufacturer, not good for European manufacturer either. So I think, the bifurcation system is not economically optimal. It's, it's politically uh, viable, but uh, economically doesn't make sense. All right, so I, I, I will speculate where it could emerge. I, I don't think 5G is likely, I think, uh, or, or 6G for that matter, because I think you know, most of the countries that we are trying to convince not to use Chinese product are basically thinking to themselves, look, I'm gonna get spied on by both the US and China, um, and it really doesn't matter what I doesn't matter what I do, and I might as well at least get the best product from the U.S. and the best product from China, and I'll get spied on. That's what's going to happen. <laughs> so I, I don't think that's going to be on 5G, 5G and, and 6G. Uh, it could be uh, on uh, uh, things that are the data intensive. So on the surveillance or big data and how that data is gathered and used to the extent that uh, this increasingly becomes a value competition between two systems, which again, I'm not sh sure I believe that it is, but that is how it's being framed. Then, especially if the US and the Europeans could get uh, you know, a true agreement on data privacy and transatlantic data flows in place, which is unlikely to happen, but just say we could, then I could imagine people saying, yes, I like this system better about how, da how data is treated and used, and I'm not really comfortable with how it's being used in that system. But we're a long way away from getting what that common European US view is, um, and it's easier for the Chinese to, you know, right now go to countries and say, you want a smart city? Great, we're gonna build it. Here's all the capabilities. Here's what you can do with all the data. One possible way in which that might happen uh, and this turns to what I was saying about the weakness of the U.S. state, might be through uh, effective U.S. regulatory outsourcing to the European Union. And this has already happened in some ways with respect to privacy. If we think about the influence that GDPR has had upon U.S. privacy debates, you know, it's very clear that more or less what happened is that the U.S., for a variety of political reasons, wasn't able to get together its act on uh, some form of comprehensive privacy legislation in order to uh, push back against European pressure in the space. And now the Europeans have effectively managed to seize the lead. So you could see this happening uh, in a, a variety of other relevant regulatory areas where the US is not particularly happy necessarily with everything that Europe does because Europe tends to be much more rule prone than the US is, but that the US would prefer a situation in which somebody with roughly compatible values was setting rules that had effective consequences for, for, for uh, multinationals with a presence in both of these uh, economic spaces and becoming a tacit rule acceptor rather than the rule leader. Can I add, add one point? So I agree with Adam about uh, the data and, uh, and, 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 and uh, regulation of data. I think that part is, is, is rather easier to, to handle for multinational company because like Huawei, the CEO says, uh, we, we like to stick to GDPR. We like the European GDPR. We want that to uh, become, a, a, we will comply with that. So if the issue is the compliance with different rules and regulation, different country, that's not new. That's multinational company does it all, all the time. So, so, so I think that is not dramatic. What is dramatic is that you have a different system which cannot talk, we cannot be inter, inter operational with each other. That, that will be a negative impact. Mm -hmm. For the soft regulation part, I think that's not big deal. Well, you guys have put a tremendous amount on the table. I want to give uh, our members of the audience a chance to weigh in. If you have a question, please raise your hand. We'll start with Jude. 
people like me who don't understand anything about technology, it seems that there's a sort of no outer bounds of where this discussion will be going, and everything seems to be, national security seems to be weaponized, always by China with sort of Xi Jinping's comprehensive national security outlook. But now here in the U.S. we say that economic security is national security. Can you just give some thoughts on how we can be bounding or at least defining national security in a way that there's a common understanding, not only between the U.S. and China, but countries around the world, and how that, how that can keep pace with technology but not hamper uh, technology? If you don't mind, hold your thought on that. I'll give you a second to think about it. Does anyone else have a question? We'll take two at a time. This lady. Um, hi, so a reporter from Shenzhen Media Group. I have uh, two questions for Professor Huang. Uh, you mentioned that um, it's a uh, bifurcation of the supply chain is not uh, economically viable. Can you elaborate with us more about this? And uh, the two question is, could this uh, U.S.-China technology tension, if the Huawei uh, uh, survival, can this be an opportunity for uh, for this company to promote the Chinese technology image? Thank you. Second question was posed directly to you, Professor Swang. Yeah. So, um, so I mean, if you have bifurcation of a system, if you have two system or three system. It's not economically optimal. It's, it, it, it can be economically viable. Because people, companies just pay the, pay the cost and develop three systems for supply the whole, uh, serve the whole world. But you have high, incur, incur higher cost than you have just develop one system. Um, uh, and about the survival of Huawei, uh, at least now uh, it has not been killed. <laughs> so according to the CEO, it's very hard to kill. And, and I think, but then we just have discussion uh, in the up morning's, uh, morning's um, uh, session that uh, the Huawei CEO put, put forward an interesting proposal that Huawei want to license its 5G technology, including blueprint patents or tacit knowledge or to an to American company. So our colleagues say this is a bluff, and uh, the media also say that, but my view is that this can be a, can be a real offer. Because my view is that there's a there's a uh, imbalance here. The most powerful country in the world has no 5G manufacturer, and 5G technology is going to transform the whole society. How come the most powerful country in the world has no manufacturer of this most powerful technology in the next decades? That's that's why the U.S. has incentive stop Huawei to 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 to, to supply more to, to more countries. But then if Huawei create a competitor in, in US or other company in US can manufacture that, Huawei has a competitor here, that will become a harmony. That will become a more balanced. Then Europe has a manufacturer, China has a manufacturer, US also has a manufacturer. Then we see each other in 6G. So I think that can be a, can be a real offer. And, 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 um, but we will wait to see the outcome of that. Another question. Um, basically, I think it was bound before because of the bilateral relation, relationship and the and multilateral institutions, right? So, um, in 2006, when the uh, mid to long term plan came out and indigenous innovation, you know, uh, was promoted as a Chinese policy, it, it was a concern. It was on the U.S. agenda. But there were so many other things on the agenda, right? Uh, North Korea, transnational problems, uh, all the other things we were working with uh, with Beijing. And so quite honestly, both sides said, all right, this is important, but this is not the thing that's going to get disrupt the agenda that all the other broader things that are going to happen. And now that we are you know, confronting China across the board, these tech issues are all expanding because they fill all of that space. So you would have to get the other parts of the bilateral relationship in place so you could then have those discussions. The other is, of course, you know, the WTO says, yes, you can have national security 
uh, exceptions for what you're going to do. But right now, nobody is relying on the WTO to make those judgments. So again, we would have to go back to, to a, a time when both China and the United States thought that those multilateral institutions or the, the that, you know, I, I don't think it's a great venue, but the open, open working group on um, whatever they're calling it, information security or cybersecurity uh, at the UN, which is the, the, you know, the competitor to the group of government experts, the Chinese submission says, you know, we need to talk about supply chain security and what you're going to do about tech companies. You know, the U.S., of course, doesn't want to touch that in that venue. But you would then go to these international institutions. But now that the, both of those things have been weakened, I, I don't see how you get back to the, you could have those discussions without getting those other things in place. Just one thing to add, which is that there are different ways in which we can think about security here. One is a standard way of thinking about national security, and the other is to think about uh, how many of these problems can be solved better from an information security lens instead. And here, for example, people like Bruce Schneier has a, a wonderful and lively entitled book, something like press here to kill everyone, uh, which uh, talks about the uh, security weaknesses of the Internet of Things, which uh, very often come about not because these uh, things have been designed specifically to be penetrated, but because these things have been designed to, to be extremely cheap, and uh, security comes in as a consideration at the last moment to the extent that it does at all. So uh, one question which I think we tend not to focus on here in debates in DC because we tend to be more policy and internationally oriented than uh, technologically oriented is to what extent can we uh, look at redesigning uh, so, th so that the attack surfaces of these things are limited, so that we have much less trusting devices, thinking about mitigation, and this can only go so far and also has to go together with a stronger regulatory approach than the one we have to date, which goes back to some of the problems discussed already, but nonetheless they're plausible is quite an amount that you could do without getting into the national security space to address the uh, massive and ever-expanding insecurity of the devices and the uh, things around us in the world. Great. Um, I just want to also say that I think that in many, there's this vision that everything's a security risk and it's just ever expanding. Oh, uh, you know, uh, IP doorbells, they're at a security risk now. We, we, we can't do anything with Chinese technology. But I think actually, like, if you if you look at what um, the, the intelligence community and the Department of Defense have been saying, they've isolated a very kind of core set of technologies that are risky technologies. And I think if we listen more to those flags, and, and they're not just saying that you can't use those at all, but they're saying, like, maybe these shouldn't be in core, you know, uh, geostrategic assets, you know, that we, there are onions, you know, there's layers of the onion where the security risk is and where it isn't. And so we really just need to pay attention to those red flags and then say, okay, how do we address those? So I think that's kind of a, a, a core lesson I would take away. Uh, hi. Uh, fabulous conversation. Um, Carl Polzer, and a lot of my work has to do with um, wealth concentration and evolution of capitalism. So. Um, I'm just wondering what, if there's separation between the U.S. economies and China, is there a political risk internally for China? This is the first meeting I've ever been to where I've heard about some of the political economy of China. The, there are competing bureaucracies. There, it's, I'm used to trade associations. Their CEOs come and talk to the bureau, uh, academics, and somehow they're all communicating with a very centralized top. So if you have slower growth, as we're seeing, the, the less of a win-win economy, and you have more risk, you gotta do the stuff yourself, and uh, will there be more conflict between very powerful and now wealthy actors in China? Like when the Soviets left, they were all poor, now you got lots of money. So how, who's gonna, how does that, how does the government, how do you guys solve those kinds of conflicts? You know, and how will that happen in a more, you know, less, uh, a more, you know, uh, more zero, zero, you know, some game environment? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I think we'll take three questions this round. So if you don't mind logging it away. Uh, I saw Martin's hand next. Thank you. Oh. Sure, go ahead. You have, the, you have the microphone, and then we'll go up here. If Sorry about that. My name is Peter Fotelning. I'm working for the European Union delegation here in town. and. Uh, you have been talking about allies. Now, now, I wonder if this is playing out here, this conversation here in the United States, 
What role do you foresee for allies of the United States around the world in this conversation? Thank you. Okay. I have a bit of a follow-up on that and drilling a bit into what uh, Ryan was asking earlier about blocks. It seems like two of the most potent tools the U.S. is using uh, more tight investment restrictions and export controls are really only going to work if we get a broad coalition together. Otherwise, it's going to be like you know, the famous study on commercial satellite in which America eviscerated its, infra its domestic industry and didn't actually prohibit the spread of the technologies. To what extent do you think that Europe and Japan, South Korea, Israel, and others would go along with the United States and, say, through Wassenaar, uh, make those export controls multilateral and also have their own CFIUS style uh, investment restrictions that would be much more than what the EU has done today. Okay, so we have three questions. One on wealth distribution effects and the latter two on ally related issues. So I try to answer the first question. So I think there will be significant political risk if things don't, ma don't, don't be managed well. Um, but I think the solution from China's side, as, I, as far as I see, is that just take pain. Because if you want to have a good deal, you have to take pain. I think it's the same from U.S. side. The U.S. also makes sacrifice in this trade war, the farmers and so on. So, but why U.S. is not eager to reach a deal? Because U.S. want more in the better outcome in a deal. So it's for China. So I think both sides has to, if you really want to uh, reach the better outcome, you have to, you have to, you have to willing to make sacrifice. Uh, I'll take the, the allies question, which is I think that, I mean, this is kind of building on this point, which is I'm not sure that the U.S. government right now has a clear strategy of what it's pursuing vis-a-vis -vis China in the technology sphere. And I think that um, if the goal is to have an alternative 5G block, for example, if that's the vision, then um, what really I think the U.S. government should have done is first create like a NATO consortium where it goes to our allies and says, you know, let's create a long-term buying program from Nokia and Ericsson and we'll create some alternative economic model so that that's successful. And then you spring the trap on Huawei and you say, I've locked down all of our allies with this alternative vision, and then now we're going to punish you know this. But instead, the government sprang the trap, but there was no carrot already to the ally block in place to create that kind of coordinated strategy. And so I think now what you have is you have a version where the, the, the trap was sprung, the allies don't know what to do, and the Chinese or Huawei can go to each one of the allies and use salami tactics to peel off, you know, Norway, you buy this, this one, that. So I think that, you know, the, the key in these, I, I'm not even sure that we want to have that kind of block strategy, but I do think whatever the U.S. government is doing in the technology sphere, it should be coordinated with our allies to think through what is a long-term strategy to maintain both our economic but also our strategic security. And I don't have the sense that the current government is pursuing that. Uh, I, mean, I, I think they're they're squandering. Quite honestly, I think there is a there is a genuine European concern about these technology flows. The you know the European Commission and others have noted it. There, the calls for CFIUS like policies inside of the the EU and Germany and France them, themselves. Uh, not, you know, uh, separate from U.S. pressure, the Israelis are probably going to get there mainly because of U.S. pressure. But I, I, I think. There is a similar concern that, you know, as, as Abe was saying, we could have gone about building it in a different way as opposed to showing up and saying, here is what you're going to do, as opposed to what should we all do together. Okay. I think we have time for another round of uh, questions. We'll start with uh, this lady here with the white short, and then Ken. Hi, my name is Liz Kim. I'm a reporter with Voice of America Korean Service. A few months ago, the Washington Post reported that uh, Huawei uh, allegedly helped North Korea build their uh, mobile network. Uh, I'm wondering how does that, how is that critical for Huawei and even for ZTE, which was fined a few years ago for violating North Korean sanctions? And how does this affect the overall U.S.-China tech relationship? Thank you. And then we will go to Ken and then the gentleman in the back, Ken Lieberthal in the front. 
Uh, my question is, regulations take a long time to develop. There's a process for them. These are not done quickly. They aren't done quickly in China either, where they require uh, substantial bureaucratic processes. Given the rate of development of technology in artificial intelligence, in the Internet of Things, in quantum computing, in virtual reality, in 5G, et cetera, uh, isn't it the case that as you try to develop new regulations, the problems will have changed before the regulations can be adopted and come into effect? In other words, we're, we're dealing with an accelerating set of technological advances that are increasingly interacting with each other. How do you begin to get your arms around that in a way that builds confidence that everyone can play by the same playbook? Thank you. And then uh, the gentleman with the gray sweater. Oh, thank you. Uh, Steve Winter is an independent consultant. Well, I think I'd like to direct this to uh, Kan Huang. Uh, could, could you uh, make some comments on the Chinese view of the competition over scientific talent? Uh, of course, China had introduced this Thousand Talents program. And uh, from all my reading of the newspapers, it hasn't gone over so well in the U.S. Various people have gotten in problems here for uh, being involved in that. Uh, uh, so is China surprised by the U.S. reaction to the Thousand Talents program, particularly given that even today we heard here, and I constantly hear in D.C., the U.S. has to be open uh, to uh, the best scientific talents in the world all coming to the U.S. and helping us with our developments? Thank you. Maybe I, ask, I answer the third question. So... Um, I think for, for China, it's surprised, I think, but it's also sad to see what happened to those talents, <laughs> those professors in the U.S. university. They were, they were charged, they were fired, they were, they, were, they, were, they, were, they were targeted. Maybe they just, they just travel between these two countries, but when a political tide changed, they, they are the victims, I think, in, 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 in this change of the time. So... Um, uh, for, for U.S., I, 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 I think that, the, I mean, I think the competitive for the U.S. is from, it's coming from the talent the U.S. attracted from over the world. And then I think also it's not going to be good for U.S. not, not to open a door for the, for, for the talents, especially from China. So I, I, that's my, 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 my answer. Thank you. Um, so on, on Ken's very brilliant point, um, I just I have a couple of reactions. I think I think you're absolutely right, and I I have two sort of reactions to that. The first is that this speaks to the need to do government differently, right, and to do regulation differently. And it speaks to Adam's point earlier about the need for greater technical capacity within governments, right. And it, it's not just the U.S. or China; it's every government. And I I think the second reaction I have is that this is this gap. I think speaks to a, a, a de facto vulnerability that we all have to get used to. I mean, if you, if you just think about it on a personal level, I know that if I connect to the internet and I have a mobile phone and a laptop, there are benefits to, to this connection, right? But I'm vulnerable, right? Regardless of how many patches I put on my computer and so on, I try to be a responsible user of technology and I do everything that, you know, is I read out there on, in, in terms of how to protect my privacy. But in a certain, to a certain degree, there's always, there's always going to be a vulnerability. So maybe it's, you know, on the one hand, we need to do govern, government differently. On the other hand, we need to stop thinking we can go back to a world where, there, where we're no longer constantly in the state of being vulnerable. And so we need to have a conversation about mitigation. Just on the Korea thing, I don't know anything about the uh, about Huawei and North Korea, but ZTE is a, an interesting and complicated story, which I think illustrates another aspect of the problem, which is that the United States, more than anything else, it is a state of lawyers. And so effectively what happened was that ZTE had, uh, had broken uh, 
pretty flagrantly uh, had violated uh, U.S. Uh, rules. You can. Uh, you can argue about whether or not uh, the US should be imposing these rules or not in the first place, had then uh, agreed to a set of penalties and had then sought effectively to be dishonest about its uh, compliance with those penalties Facing the U.S. was a very difficult choice. You know, so it, it, does it does it um, sort of uh, uh, ignore and pretend that it's blind, or does it seek to then uh, implement the uh, implement the penalties that it had suspended? And of course, this turns out to have pretty dramatic consequences, as has been discussed for the uh, debate within China. But for, from the perspective of the debate in the U.S., I suspect that the lawyers who were involved saw this as being a pretty cut uh, cut, cut and dried case where they had no choice but to impose these penalties uh, come what may and where they uh, you know so where they they you know so they believe that they had little little choice to do this and were extremely unhappy I would imagine when Trump effectively bargained the uh, bargained the penalty away in exchange for trade concessions seeing this as something which would weaken the uh, credibility of the United States when it sought to impose penalties on uh, well-connected firms abroad in the future. Thank you very much. I think that we addressed all three of those questions. I want to give the panelists an opportunity for a final comment or parting shot uh, before we wrap up. I propose that we start at the end with Adam and work our way back to me. Uh, I, you know, I, I guess part of the takeaway is you know the continued use of decoupling, which I'm going to continue doing, um, <laughs> even though it, I think the de declining <laughs> declining usefulness of it. Um, I don't know what to do with that, but I think. Um, the more we think about it and the more we talk about it in these venues, it clearly is not a useful comment, but I'm going to continue using it. So, <laughs> <laughs> so we have defiance from Adam. <laughs> San Juan? So, so, so my conclusion, uh, conclusion, uh, concluding the remark is that two countries should not decouple. It works better <laughs> not decouple. And, and, but find a way to define the relationship between the two countries. Maybe in the first time in history, that two countries has to define the, the route, how to deal with each other and with other countries. Uh, I would just say, I think at this moment, we are at a moment where the parties don't know the world that they're in. It's, it's very uh, similar to after World War II. There were, uh, it's a new constellation of who the great powers are, what are the technologies at hand, and how should you go about interacting with each other? And I think things like the ZTE case or the Huawei case, I don't think there's like, oh, the US government had fully worked out what this was gonna do and how China was gonna respond. I, I think it's very much a high level of uncertainty about who the actors are, what, what strategies can they use, and what the consequences would be. And we all, I think, need to be just very cognizant of that we're in this very uncertain world as we move forward. Uh, just to agree with that and to say that uh, if we're moving into a world, it's not like the Cold War in many, many ways, despite the facile uh, comparisons some people make. But some of the stuff that went together with the Cold War, that is the uh, quiet discussion of rules of the road, the uh, creation of a means to uh, talk informally, to figure out before you did something what the consequences of that might be, all of these things could be extremely useful. Also, more generally, when we think about, uh, uh, about how to deal with it, we should think about mitigation, and we should involve much, much more than we have to date technologists into the conversation so that we can have a sophisticated discussion about the circumstances under which we may be able to, if not uh, eliminate security problems, because these systems are going to be irreducibly complex, at least uh, minimize them as much as possible with technological rather than a policy, uh, technological solutions rather than and, uh, policy conflicts? I would say let's not reduce the entire US-China relationship to two companies, Huawei and ZTE, right? The relationship is much deeper. And I would urge everyone to read um, an article by Ian Johnston in the journal International Security, where he maps out China's participation in international institutions across a whole range of different issues, right? And it's really illuminating. It's a really illuminating exercise because you see China supporting, being a staunch supporter of some issue areas, wavering on others, you know. So it, it's, it's uh, much more multidimensional than just two companies. Thank you very much. I, I took away three big points from our conversation today. The first is that pure decoupling is impractical. A return to the status quo pre-2016 is unavailable. 
The second is that this intensifying technology uh, pressure in the overall relationship is having effects inside China, some of which may not be visible to the outside eye. And the third is that we need to really work collectively to define with greater precision what the problems are so that we can begin to solidify new rules of the road for managing them as, as Henry laid out. But with that, I invite you all to join me in thanking this very distinguished group for elevating our understanding of the problem. Thanks for watching. Be sure to like and subscribe for more videos from Brookings.